Hi everybody, it's Phoebe from The Horror Show. And guess what? It's spring, and guess what that means? Time to shop for a new wardrobe! And guess where we're headed? That's right, Subculture Corsets. We can shop online at subculturecorsets.com or stop in at the store in the Avenues Mall off of 95 in Jacksonville, Florida. When you place your order, tell me you heard about it on The Horror Show with Brian Keene and get 10% off your total order. Whether you do it online or in the store, Make sure you stop in and tell them Phoebe sent you. And don't forget to get something really cute for the new season. Gonna see you soon. No comment. Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f <laughs> What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over. No comment. The f Brian Keene was also unavailable for comment. Welcome back to The Horror Show, brought to you by Morphine and Oxycontin. I am your host, Brian Keene, uh, Dave in the background engineering, but he's not going to be here long because I'm not going to be here long. Uh, we are, of course, The Horror Show with Brian Keene, brought to you by the Project Entertainment Network, available for free every week on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, which is brand new, and all other platforms, including the project entertainment network.com um i'm sure you've heard by now unless you live under a rock but i was in a a horrible horrible accident uh a little over a week and a half ago by the time you were listening to this i spent uh most of a week in a burn ward uh basically got first and second degree burns on my scalp and my face Second and third on my arm. Uh, I've got some nice synthetic skin on my arm right now that my real skin is growing around and over and into. And uh, I want to thank everybody uh, that has reached out. Everybody that has offered their prayers, their thoughts, their magic spells. Everyone that's offered a laugh. Um, uh, everyone that has contributed to the GoFundMe. Uh, the link for that is on my social media. Just go to BrianKeen.com and you can find the GoFundMe. Uh, as of this recording, it's it's over fifty thousand uh, dollars. We were told by several medical professionals that our bills could exceed third three hundred thousand um, dollars. I'm sure we will get them to knock that price down, but still, it's going to be a very high figure. So we we appreciate everybody that uh, that contributed to that. If I if I sound like I'm babbling, uh, again, this show is brought to you by Morphine and Oxycontin. Um, this show is also brought to you by Pulp Fest. Uh, when is that taking place, Dave? Um, I believe it's the end of July. Near the end of July? Near the end of July, yeah, says yeah. the ad copy. Yeah. Wow, okay. Should we read the ad copy? Um, oh, wait. Now, this is Mary's instructions on the food. <laughs> All right. Well, Dave, Dave is going to look up Pulp Fest for you. Um, <laughs> you know. Like, that <laughs> copy makes no sense. <laughs> so I look. Well, when I am able to do a full show, we will come back. We will talk in detail about the accident. We'll share funny stories from the burn ward, including Keith Giffen's uh, "Fuck you, I've got Guardians of the Galaxy money" phone call. <laughs> um, but I, I want to thank everybody that has contributed to the GoFundMe. I also want to thank our more wealthy listeners. Uh, you know, both from the private specter and the world of entertainment who have reached out and made some private donations. Um, I'm not going to name them on the air unless they ask me to. Um, we appreciate it. We appreciate it. Uh, we even appreciate uh, S.T. Yoshi and Jason Brock's little, little dancing puppet uh, who has been celebrating this accident all week on Twitter. We'll be talking about him next week and uh, speculation that I've seen online that he might, in fact, be a pedophile. I am, of course, talking about the 
the editor of Weird Webzine. But we'll get into all that next week. Um, but again, I want to I want to thank Pulp Fest for sponsoring this week's show. Is that the ad copy yes, there, Dave? Yes, yes. Pulp Fest, uh, of course, their guest of honor is Joe R. Lansdale, another person who's been real supportive this week. Uh, Joe, I love you. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, Pulp Fest 2018 takes place July 26th through the 29th at the Double Tree by Hilton in Cranberry Township. That is out near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There'll be thousands of pulp magazines, vintage paperbacks, original art, and other collectibles. And as I said, you can meet his own self, this year's guest of honor, Joe R. Lansdale. You can learn all about it at pulpfest.com. So what we're going to do now, since I am in no shape to do a full show, uh, this is a musical episode of the horror show with Brian Keene, and Dave hates me for asking him to throw all this together. But no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. No. Okay. I never hate you. All right. We, uh, even when you sing. Even when I sing? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Although you, you test his love. Oh, there's Mary in the background now. <laughs> We're not supposed to talk. Hey, Dave. Yes. I'm burning, I'm burning, I'm burning for you. Yeah, I, I, I'm a horrible person because I thought of that joke the other day. But then I saw you use it. I'm you know what I thought of? <laughs> oh, I'm on fire. <laughs> so... Mary's expression on her face right now <laughs> might be the most annoying expression I've ever seen her make, and that's saying something. <laughs> so basically, we've got uh, we've got a couple performing acts for you. We've got a couple interviews with musicians. Uh, we are going to start off with author Ronald Malfi, uh, who also plays in the band Veer, um, and this is him performing not at this year's horror show at Brian Keene Telethon, but our original inaugural horror show with Brian Keen Telethon from 2017. So let's listen to Ron. The song's called White.
Okay, so that was Ronald Malfi. Again, uh, you probably know him as, as one of your favorite authors, uh, but check out his band Veer. Uh, now what we're going to do, we're going to go to episode 88 for an interview with Nathan Carson, drummer for the heavy metal band Witch Mountain, uh, as well as a, a band promoter and agent and uh, a horror writer in his own right. Uh, a fantastic cosmic horror novel, uh, his, his debut novel. Um, which Jesus fucking Christ, Dave! The 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 morphine is eating away my brain. What the fuck was the the name? Star Creek. Star Creek. Star Creek. That's it. Um. So let's let's listen to Nate. All right, Nate. <laughs> I forgot to ask you: Is there anything you don't want to talk about before we hit record? Too late now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an open book. Here's what I find interesting about you. Um, you know, Star Creek. Now I've read it. Um, it works as a horror novel. It works as a bizarro novel. Um, I'm not sure what readers will classify it as. Um, and, you know, it came out through Lazy Fascist. They've done both horror and bizarro. So I don't, we'll, we'll wait to see what the, the reading public thinks. But knowing your, your taste in fiction, when you were nine, you wrote a story about an anthropomorph <laughs> anthropomorphic loaf of bread in the wild west called billy the bread now you did this long before there was anything known as the bizarro genre um so were you drawn to like the weird and surreal even at that age i think always um the first tv i ever saw was godzilla movies we right. we lived in rural indiana and channel 49 was the only channel we got uh, besides pbs so it was muppets and godzilla and rodan and gamera were like that's what i was relating to from a very young age <laughs> it was always the saturday afternoon movie it was non-stop yeah. on the clock for that. Now, did you get the Tom Baker Doctor Who, too? Yes, I yeah. grew up on Tom Baker Doctor Who. Uh, my grandmother was very into Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers and uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Okay. So, and my mom's a librarian. So I was really encouraged um, to be interested in fantasy from a young age. That's and, of awesome. course, you know, Rankin and Bass, Hobbit, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And um, as you know from living through it, we were starved for fantasy fare back in those times. So, you know, when you get a film like Conan or Crawl or even um, Laser Blast, whatever it yeah. is, you, we, we checked out all of it because there was such a limited supply. I don't think kids these days can even imagine, like, how much we had to savor whatever there was. I sat through 1990 The Bronx Warriors because yeah. there was nothing else to watch. Yeah, I mean, I rented every single post-apocalyptic film in, on VHS. Same here. Period. Yep, every Friday I'd, I'd ride my bike down to the, the video store. And, yep, and then you say, oh, I actually have seen this. It was just under another title with yep. a different cover before. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so Lovecraft is obviously a big influence on your work. Um, you discovered him at age 10 via Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. Um, here's, here's what I've always proposed about Lovecraft. It, it goes back to what Dave said about Phantasm. I think to really be a fan of his work, you have to discover him at a certain age. Sure. Um, do you think if you had found him later in life, he would have had as much of an impact on you? I mean, it's so hard to say, but the fact is he did have a big impact on me. I was so drawn to the vibe and the language and I really discovered him before Stephen King or Clive Barker, yeah. and so I never really gravitated towards popular horror as much as I went more towards weird and Victorian. Right. So what else were you reading at that time, other than Lovecraft? Well, my favorite... Like M.R. James, William Hope Hodgson, stuff like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I loved Robert W. Chambers. Uh, I actually have a kind of funny, quick Chambers story. I, I was hanging out with this guy in Eugene... Uh, Oregon when I was about 19 and we were both super into Lovecrafty and stuff and he knew I was interested in Robert W. Chambers and I went to this bookstore one day and I climbed up the ladder to the top shelf and found this Robert James book and I opened it up and there was a note inside saying, Nate, this isn't one of the good ones and it was like one of his nautical romances but I just thought, like, I'm in this story I just, like, climbed to the top shelf and opened this ancient book and there's a note to me in it. It was really, really interesting. Wow. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean... I like all those authors in that circle, but Lovecraft was king for me and until I discovered Gene Wolfe, and yeah. that, that is really my favorite author. See, you just took one of my questions, and Dave, I'm not making this up. I said here, I spot the influence of Clive Barker, Sam Raimi, and perhaps Gene Wolfe? You're just making my heart 
go pitter patter. Well, it, <laughs> I, I mean it as a compliment, man. So, but you stole my question. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did you want to phrase it? That's Fuck exactly it. how I was going to phrase it. Um, yeah, I can see that. I can definitely see the gene. I mean, your voice is is your own. It's very strong, and from having read your short fiction and now reading your novel, you can definitely see you progressing. Excellent. Um, which is what you want to happen. But yeah, there's a there's there's a hint of Gene Wolfe in there, a very strong hint of Gene Wolfe. I mean, the top shelf in my bedroom is 30 Gene Wolfe books, and I've read them all, and I've, you know, I've studied him for a long time. And certainly there are you know, traits I don't want to draw from. Right. You know, he's, he's got his own territory carved out. Well, but, yeah. But I've learned a lot from him. Um, just reading his, his work, I think, is make, making me a better writer. Your one desert island Gene Wolfe book. I mean, Shadow of the Torturer is yeah. such a landmark, um, and... I, I'm always the first to say that the Book of the New Sun is better than Tolkien or Dune. Well, that's a bold statement. It's been a long time since I have to go back and reread it. I, you know what? I think I would agree with that statement. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's definitely better than Dune. I'm not the world's biggest Dune fan, but I see. I like the first book, but I think after that, it's like, eh. yeah. I and I don't think I got past the third one. Um, I, I like those. I mean, I, I think of those books very highly, and Tolkien is huge to me. Yeah. I just think that Wolf is a better writer, and I love his imagination, and I love where he goes with it. And it he certainly should have gotten the accolades that, that Tolkien had got later. Yeah. You know? I think he's sadly going to have to pass before we see him being taught in, you know, as widely as he deserves to be, because I, I look at Gene Wolfe the way... I would look at James Joyce or Melville or someone like I, that. I agree. The fact that he chose fantasy as his oeuvre is, you know, great for me, right. but maybe not great for his career. Right. No, I agree. I agree. Um, speaking of careers and paths and choices, you've never had one path. You know, you wrote and played music both throughout your teen years. Then, if I'm remembering correctly, around age 19, you started sort of definitely veering towards music? Well, when I was 19, I read Creating Short Fiction by Damon Knight at the recommendation of Gene Wolfe uh, in an essay. And that's, a, that's a good book. Damon Knight says, if you're under 30, you might want to go get some life experience before you take writing seriously. And I took that to heart, and uh, so I waited till I was 40 to really get serious about this. And took it in, a little too serious. <laughs> well, in the, in, the, in the interim, I'd had uh, a full career as a computer animator, and... Uh, my musical career had had really gone somewhere by then, and I'd done a lot of traveling. I'd met thousands of people, and I had a lot of life experience. Right. When I was nineteen, the world was a mystery, and I had you know was still forming a lot of opinions. Right. Now I've got an opinion on many subjects. So were were you of a mind? I want to be a writer. I'll do computer animation until that happens. I'll do music until that happens. Or well, I I or was it more? I want to do art be it music or writing or whatever, so I'll, I'll do this. I think it was more like that. Okay. And, and I mean, it's such a funny thing to reference as an inspiration, but I think reading The Fountainhead as a teenager actually helped push me towards putting my art first, too. I mean, there are a lot of... I don't agree with Rand politics at all, but I really was inspired by, the, you know, the Howard Rourke character of, like, you have to make this art happen, and, you know, no matter what, right. what else gets in the way. But... That aside, um, music really took over for a long time and became a vehicle for travel and networking. And it's just, as a as a small guy behind a computer, I like being able to be a caveman on the drum set, too. It's like a really <laughs> great physical outlet. It's really cathartic. Right. And um, so it sort of balances out my life in that way. Uh, and, I, and then I have had a journalism career that entire time, too. So I've done a lot of nonfiction writing. And by the time I was 40, I just kind of looked around at my life and said, okay, I'm my own boss, I make my own schedule, and I feel really passionate about writing, and I know how to not be a hobbyist about art. Right. And not that there's anything wrong with being a weekend warrior or whatever you do, that's, that's fine. But to me, after spending 19 years like struggling and climbing my way up in the music scene, I just thought, all right, I'm going to take a faster, more aggressive path with writing. And I don't have to, I'm, it's not a collaborative art form in the same way. Like, no, as a not. drummer, I'm always working at the pace of three other people, at least. Yeah, and as a writer, it's all on me. Right. And I think that's largely why it's happening much more quickly, is because 
it's I can just uh, make it happen on my own. Yeah. I want to circle back around to that, but something you said stuck in my head. A little guy mm -hmm. being a caveman on the drums. Now, yeah, you are. You're you're a, a, a not a little guy, but you know you're you're thin of frame. Yeah. Um. You know, Richard Christie, one of my dearest friends in the world, one of metal's best drummers. You know, depending on the poll. Um. You know, we've talked about how physically taxing it is. How do you do it? Well, I mean, do, do, are people surprised, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, especially when I used to have short hair and, you know, birth control glasses. Yeah. There, were, there were guys that wouldn't give me the time of day until I walked off stage. And, you know, then all of a sudden the bass player of Spirit Caravan saying, Dude, you tricked me with that Buddy Holly shit. And then you and your Des Moines and Raging Slab. What the fuck? You know? That's, so, that's a pretty good impression. Yeah, that's Dave, that's Dave Sherman. He's a love him. Love him. Uh, so, yeah, definitely... There are people, you know, who, or they see me on stage and then meet me and they're like, oh, you look taller on stage. Yeah. But either way, I stretch before I play. Right. And I try to, you know, I eat well. I try to take good care of myself. I get a lot of rest when I'm not on tour. Right. And Drink uh, a lot of water. Yeah, I do drink a lot of water. Yeah. And also, I'm in a band that plays really slow. So I feel like I could do this into my 70s. That's true. Uh, that's Well, that was going to be my next question. You're what? You're early 40s, right? Yeah, I'm 43. Okay. So are you starting to, to notice an impact on you? It, you know? The impact for me is that I've been rear-ended three different times while stopped at a red light in the last 13 years. Oh, like, oh, never man. in my fault. I mean, there's nothing you can do when you just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But So, so my neck and shoulder are definitely fucked on certain levels but yeah. um you know that's that's part of aging and it's part of life and uh so so it goes yeah wow all right so let's circle back around to writing evil dead lovecraft devil dinosaur godzilla movies gene wolf um i feel like you get me i do get you <laughs> you're like the little brother i never had don't tell steven kazanowski i said that he'll, he'll be very jealous or, or jeff burke for that matter but uh Oh, I'm sorry. I had to. I had to glance there at, at my phone. It's blowing up. It's Cub Scout meeting. There's drama oh. with the Cubs with Dungeon Masters <laughs> drop Cub Scout troop. I got kicked out of the Cub Scouts. Yeah, I I quit Cub Scouts when about the same time I discovered girls. I was there for the D and D and the Oreos, and uh, in order to progress from wolf to bear, they said I had to visit my local church or synagogue, and I never went back. You, well, we just did that one. Yeah. yeah, we did. It. We, we visited a, a pagan site. Oh, that's and, awesome. And that okay. counted, yeah. Is that really? Yeah, that's awesome. That counted. I, was, I, I gotta ask, why do you have to visit a church or synagogue? It it's, uh, it, it's a, it's a, they, they, it's a, it's not like Christian Bible school where they're trying to indoctrinate right. you, but they want the boys to be aware that there are different faiths. Okay. And, you know, they, the book was written back in the fucking 70s, so it says, you know, church or synagogue, not recognizing there are other religions, right. but the, the scouts themselves. I, I was not a fan of the scouts when Dungeon Master wanted to join, because in my head, scouts was still this this ultra-right Christian organization that didn't want to let gay people in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, that's what I thought. I, so. I've got to admit, I I was hesitant to let him join, but he really, really wanted to. And I have been pleasantly surprised. Uh, it has been my experience that they are not that at all. Okay. Now, I haven't dealt with them on a national level. It's all very local level, state level, but very open and, and very diverse and, and very of the times. Okay, well, that's good to yeah. know. I, I Obviously, not having kids, I don't know any of this stuff, so, yeah, so. Um, that's that's good to know. I just I did not know that that was a requirement yeah. of whatever you're doing there. The, yeah, I, I can't remember the name of the badge, but yeah, we just had to okay. do that one. But anyway, yeah, they're blowing up my phone. Apparently, there's drama about, okay. about tonight's meeting. Oh, well, well. We'll get to that later. <laughs> so, okay, you, all those influences, none of them, I wouldn't classify any of them as bizarro. I mean, I guess maybe Godzilla. Um, so when did you first discover the bizarro genre? I was sent some... Well, okay, I guess to me, I consider Mark Lehner to be a sort of proto-bizarro writer. yeah. And that's something that my mom handed to me, uh, I don't know, in 1990, whenever my cousin, my gastroenterologist, came out. Yeah. And I took to it immediately. I mean, I loved the way he broke the rules, and I love his language... And I love 
his sort of stream of consciousness, literary glue sniffing manner. Right. And uh, so, so that was a probably my first really deep foray into kind of that world. And then I was sent some books to review D. Harlan Wilson and um, Carl Mel Mel Melick. Right. Quite a while back. Um, but what really got me involved was. Um, Cameron Pierce edited Best Bizarro Fiction of the Decade. Right. And that is just such an incredible survey of the landscape of what's possible with Bizarro Fiction. And it's not that I thought, okay, this is me, this is all I'm going to do, but I love the way people are rewriting the rules and opening up possibilities with fiction. Right. And just the fact that I live in Portland, which is kind of ground zero for well, Bizarro in the that's, first place. That's what I was curious about. Like, all this was happening in Portland. Portland, man, it's like San Francisco and Seattle and all the other scenes. You, you've got this, this music scene going on there, this mm-hmm. comic book scene going on, the Bizarro scene. That's all happening while you're there. Did, like, had you heard rumors of... of this this weird subgenre that was starting to make a splash. I was familiar with the magazine and Bizarro Fiction okay. when that was happening, um, and really when I started writing more seriously, somebody mentioned to me, "This is Bizarro." Yeah. Uh, some of my early short stories, and I so I did a little bit more research, and I I tried to send some stuff to the magazine, but it was right as they were sort of shutting it down. Right. But. Uh, someone else said, "Oh, that your writing reminds me of Garrett Cook," and so I I picked up a copy of Time Pimp. And then shortly thereafter, befriended him online. He actually helped edit some of my early work. And then he moved to Portland not long after. Yeah. And I picked him up from the airport. I helped him find a place to live and started attending a lot of meetings that Rose O'Keefe puts on. Like we have, There's a monthly Bizarro Writers gathering in Portland. And we go have beers and talk about what's going on. And, yeah. and they've just been, they were so welcoming and so encouraging. And uh, I feel like they have really helped me step up the ladder a little bit to get involved with publishing. Cool. Excellent. Garrett's a good guy. I want to have him on uh, next month when I'm out in Portland for Bizarro. I highly recommend it. I mean, his book last year, God of Hungry Walls, is one of the most extreme horror novels I've ever read. Yeah. See, I haven't got... It's in there on my TVR pile. Now you said that, i got to move it up. It's not for most people, but it's very well done. Yeah. Max is <laughs> is doing his own show yes, in the kitchen, Dave. Yes, is, he is. Is the equipment picking that up? Uh, maybe, but it's okay because it's Max. Yeah, yeah, for the listening audience, Max has been put on a diet, doctor's orders. Yes, he's not. And happy. for the first time in his... What is he now? Nine years? years old the yeah. first time in nine years food isn't readily available in his bowl and he is not having any of it he's glaring at us he's like zabu my, my cats have been on uh, what i call the cat diet for years because my many years ago my vet said you can't leave food out you can only feed them certain times of every day right now of course they have not ever gotten used to this and there's constant bitching about the lack of food and as i point out to them they are not starving you know right. i haven't found any cat skeletons in my uh kitchen because they have not had food not so yet my about, girlfriend recently yeah. introduced wet food to my cat whiskey and she's a crack fiend for it now uh, yeah that's that, always, that never goes well no. so max hang in there you'll be a she cat. being the cat not my girlfriend <laughs> <laughs> so nate i know you've never been the chief lyricist for witch mountain but i know you and i had talked at one point about brainstorming a concept album together and i still kick myself in the ass i was dog tired the end of the con and I missed out but uh, have any of your short stories or even Star Creek has anything you've written started out as a song idea or an album idea I did write the lyrics for the very first Witch Mountain song ever it's called A Power Greater right. and it's kind of about dinosaurs and rainbows and things that I so thought it's like would an be. ode to Dio <clears throat> partially yeah. yeah yeah. and our friend Erica Stoltz uh, sang it and she did a very good uh, Dio impression on that actually yeah. But in general, uh, since then, I've refocused my writing outside of the band because uh, we've always had great lyricists working on those songs, so um, I wasn't needed for that, and that's totally cool. Right. Um, And I have written and sung songs in other groups. In fact, uh, my girlfriend and I recently did a performance of a song that I wrote in the 90s. uh, At Mother Foucault's bookshop in Portland, we performed a song called Monorail to Everywhere that I wrote in like 98 and it was on an album by a band called Bishop of Battle and I when Bishop of Battle toured with Man or Astro Man we bumped into Jello Biafra 
in San Francisco, and I gave him that CD, and he sent me a postcard a month later and told me how much he liked those lyrics. Nice. So they were really bent. Oh, that's really cool. Nice. Yeah, so <laughs> that's very guy, cool. Yeah. That's very cool. You guys tour a lot. I mean, Witch Mountain's always on the road. Um, anytime, it seems like anytime I'm coming to Portland, you're out here on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now you've got your first novella out. You're always doing articles and shorts. Do you write when you're on tour? I mean, do you write on the road? I wish I could. I get car sick, so it makes it really hard. I mean, we're pretty much at a venue or in the van or passed out most of the time. So it's enough for me to just try to keep up with my daily business right. from the road. Maybe eventually if we were in a bus, I, I would love to be writing on the road. Yeah. Uh, I am trying to do some writing for a project that I got, a comic project that I got asked to be involved in. Ooh, can you um, talk about it or no? I could say that it is an adaptation of a classic public domain property that is not H.P. Lovecraft, Ooh. and that uh, well, I'll be working with the artist who drew the covers of Cauldron of the Wild and Mobile of Angels, Sam Ford, who's a Ooh. really tremendous illustrator. So, And he and I have been friends for years and have wanted to do a comic project for years. Right. He grew up apprenticed to Paul Chadwick, who was the guy who did Concrete yeah. for Dark Horse. So anyway, um, I'm really excited to do this, but I don't really want to announce it yet because... Okay. Uh, I don't want anybody else to scoop us. No, no, absolutely. So, have you ever tried uh, recording, like using a little digital voice recorder and, and writing that way, dictation? It's, it's it's a good idea, but I haven't done that much. No, I uh, I'm a fast typer. Yeah. So that's really what's comfortable to me. Same here. I I had never tried it, and uh, Kevin J. Anderson back in April of this year, he's like, you know, because uh, he's on the road all the time too. And, I, you know, he still manages to write 12 fucking books a year. And I'm like, how, how do you do that? And he, he told me he, he dictates everything mm -hmm. into a digital voice recorder. And then somebody types it up for him. I've tried it yeah. while I've been out on tour this summer. It doesn't work for me. Everybody has their process. And I have a very feast or famine kind of mindset. You know, to me, like, I won't write something for months. And then I'll write several stories in a row. Yeah. I, I kind of like to binge in that way. Because it's sort of similar to music. Like, I love touring until maybe the last week of tour, and then I want to be home, you know, in one place, not moving for a couple of months. That's where I'm at right now, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, And yeah. I, I should mention, that reminds me, I forgot to mention. Oh, yeah. Uh, this Friday, tomorrow, you're listening to this on Thursday, yeah, tomorrow, Mary and I will be uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, all weekend for the Imaginarium Convention, and... Uh, I think two weeks after that is the the Mary Merrimack book Halloween book whatever the hell Chris Golden is called yes. that thing um, <laughs> in Haverhill, Massachusetts, and uh, end of the month New York City uh, live appearance at the KGB Bar. Good, always good to to go there. Um, you gotta you gotta book yourself a reason. I then. was dying to be a part of it, and as the agent, I really tried to make that line up, but yeah. unfortunately, it couldn't. So instead. My first reading on this particular tour is going to be at the St. Vitus Bar in Brooklyn, right when the doors open at our show on Friday. Nice. And then I also have readings set up uh, at the Turf Club in St. Paul with M.P. Johnson. Yeah. Someone's talking to me about maybe adding Madison in, and then, of course, Ross Lockhart's got me at Copperfields in Petaluma right before our show in Oakland. Nice. And then I, the actual official reading release for Star Creek is going to be first Thursday, December 1st at Powell's on Hawthorne in Portland. Yeah. Now, have you ever done public readings? I have for with short stories in, yeah. uh, in Portland for the last couple of years. Uh, there was an event that Ed Morris puts on called The Hour That Stretches, and right. I, I really cut my teeth there a lot, and then I set up a Powell's reading for a bunch of the Portland authors that were in Cthulhu Fatagan, right. and that went really well. I, I'm curious, because, I mean, you do the radio show, you know, obviously you know how to speak in public, um, but so much of your career has been spent behind the drums, you sure. know, there at the back of the stage, so what's it like to step forward and suddenly you're reading what you wrote, and was, I, was it a learning curve? I was a lot more nervous having a mic put in front of me even five years ago, but I had to host this event that I put on called the Portland Metal Winter Olympics that was kind of like a very good-natured battle of the bands where everybody won something, and, you know, <laughs> no, one, no one was, you know... Everybody gets a participation trophy. No one was humiliated. It was a really good time, but uh, just stepping up and hosting a night almost like a game show... Uh, 
at the exact same time that I was launching my radio show. Right. Those two things coincided with uh, with me starting to read my fiction in public, and so uh, yeah, I think I just came a long way in a short time. Cool, cool. Do you uh, do you ever find that like you sit down to write and you really want to play, or you, you're up there on the drums and you really want to go write? <laughs> I mean, does that ever hit you, and how do you make that transition? I mean, there's definitely times where you sit down to write, and uh, you really don't want to be there. You want to be anywhere but there. But I think getting over that fear is just part of the process. I, you know, for me, it's a little bit like there's these stories are like growths or tumors that I'm tearing out of myself a little bit. It's a great analogy. That's that's just how, and and I don't mean that in a you know excruciating way but when I've written a story I feel like there's a little bit of a cavity there that has to kind of grow back and fill in right okay that makes sense now uh, I know you listen to the show you heard our interview with John Skip right uh huh he uh, he talked on there at length about how uh, certain herbal substances we still have to say it like that because it's not legal in every state um, helps him creatively do you do you find the well, yes, <laughs> that would be the simple answer. Um, one of the most amazing processes I've found for my fiction writing is consuming these herbal substances and going to the symphony. Really? And I have had entire, like, characters and multi-act stories vividly come to me high at the symphony. Not a metal show. No. Not a club where there's a DJ spinning techno. You go to the symphony. Yes, Huh. Uh, and I have a somewhat of an advantage because I preview the symphonies for the biggest weekly in Portland, so right. I get free tickets. I, you know, I've been seeing. I never saw a symphony growing up. I've I've seen thousands of rock shows. We well, are in the middle but, of Indiana, they, right? They don't right. Have symphonies. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, in the last four or five years, um, the editor at the weekly said, "Is anyone interested in writing about classical music?" And I raised my hand to the ceiling and said, "Yes, that would be me." And now I've seen dozens and dozens of symphonies, and it's just, there's just something about being in this acoustically perfect room, sitting up in the balcony, watching like 40 or 50 people pouring all of this energy into this really classic music. It's, you know, usually there's no vocals to, right. to be distracted by, and it just takes my mind on a journey. It, it really lets me kind of let go. And, you know, I'm not doing the writing right there. That's a brainstorming exercise. Right. And then I more soberly sit down and write this out, and then I also think that it's uh, the substances are helpful for editing process too. Yeah, see, I can't, I, I can't, I can, I can do it on bourbon, mm -hmm. um, but anything else, I just, I get no. silly. If I had half a beer, I would be unable to write. Yeah, see, so. I, I can drink bourbon all night and write. I often do, but anything else, I just get silly and stupid. Everybody's and, wired differently yeah. and has different equilibriums. Like if if I have an iced tea. I will be up till tomorrow. <laughs> no. So, well, let's talk about time management. Um, you play in one of the best doom metal bands. You tour. You write nonfiction, fiction. You run your own booking agency. You represent other musical acts. Plus, you've got your radio show, your girlfriend, your cat, all this other stuff. How the fuck do you do it all? I'm, you know, this is the the main takeaway from this interview because I know we got a lot of a lot of creatives out there listening. What are what are Nathan Carson's time management tips? <laughs> I think the well, there's two things. One, throughout the year, I always get enough sleep because I couldn't do all these things if I was short on sleep. So that's a big priority to me is to get eight hours of sleep. Eight hours. Night. Okay. Uh, then the other thing is my phone and my computer calendar sync with each other and I live by them. Like anything that needs to get done needs to go into that calendar. And if I need to set an alert for myself or, or a reminder or to-do lists or whatever it takes, I'm constantly chiseling away at an avalanche of activities and responsibilities. And, you know, it, it is probably the most stressful thing in my life is just over committing and constantly having um, deadlines. But... I also know that it always all gets done eventually, and I don't have you know people angry at me. You know, there are people that sometimes are waiting for an answer, or but right. but it all gets done, and and uh, it gets done well. Right. So, at a, it's it's kind of the same thing as being a freelancer and worrying about your finances. It's like, well, at a certain point, 
you know, like my last real job was in 1998 and I'm not starving. So I don't, I don't need to worry about the finances because it's, there's always a trickles, all these different trickles coming in right. from all these different gigs. So, you know. Yeah. I'll, so that, that's it. To-do lists and, and eight hours of sleep and lots of water. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really drink a lot of water. Well, see, Dave, that, that's the problem. I'm not. I'm drinking too much coffee, too much whiskey, not enough water, and I don't sleep. So, right. I am getting my eight hours. So I, I have no choice at this point. I wish, except when Mary's here, she keeps me up to like two or three in the morning because that's that's when she's awake. That's when right. she does her writing. Is at night? Oh yeah, you know? I, I tend to write late. Yeah, I, I mean, it's particularly because I have you know usually DJ gigs or musical gigs several times a week that go late. Yeah, there's no sense in me trying to be on a morning schedule. See, I've got an eight-year-old. Ten o'clock, I'm ready for bed. <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, David Scal, he writes overnight. Mary writes overnight. I think John Skip writes. So you do. Yeah, it's different for everybody. Yep. I'm up early. I get my best shit done between like five in the morning and ten in the morning. And as long as you recognize that and roll with it, that's that's always what's going to be the best. I think people that fight, you know, someone who reads an article about how you have to write a thousand words a day and do it first thing in the morning it's like yeah if that's what works for you yeah. that's what you should do there are no hard and fast rules no. so you're an agent um excuse me i didn't mean to burp into the microphone there you're a booking agent um imp said quote nate carson is one of the most important people in metal but you probably never heard of him or his company nanotier yet this is the man who books rolling stone's favorite metal band of 2014 who books legends like Nick Turner's Hawkwind, one of your favorite bands, Dave? <laughs> Out of the Bees. Have you ever told this story on the air? I have to. I here's the thing. I can't tell that story until I find a copy of that because I won't remember the whole thing. Yeah. And it, you need. I just need to read that thing, the review that I wrote. Dave, on the show. Dave's experience at the Hawkwind concert. Oh, I look forward to that. Still one of my favorite things you've ever. I'll written. really search for trying to find it because we've not told that story on the yeah. air. Yeah. Uh, IMP goes on to say he's played shows in almost every state in the United States with his own band, the critically acclaimed Witch Mountain. Carson represents a new wave in heavy metal professionals, having figured out how to make a living in one of the most obscure corners of the genre. And he's become one of the most respected booking agents in the industry. End quote. Um, now, we've talked about time management, and we've, you know, we, we talked a little bit about how like when you guys are on tour, you do a lot of your bookings and you're able to negotiate a lot of things. Um, is there anything you've learned from that that you've that you've applied to your writing as far as career your career goes? Well, I absolutely think that my abilities to network are a boon. Uh, so many authors are reclusive, shy, misanthropic people, and I can go to conventions and meet everybody right. and befriend them. I am, as an agent, my job is to make artists feel comfortable and, you know, preen their feathers. And uh, I think that a lot of uh, high-strung authors enjoy that soothing as well. Right. So my challenge has always just been to make the time and to make my writing as good as it can possibly be because I feel like the rest you know networking and publishing is not my big not my challenge right what about uh, your other bandmates are Justin and Rob and Kayla supportive of, of your writing as, as this progresses and grows I mean you and Rob you guys have pretty much been together since the beginning of Witch Mountain. Yeah, we founded it together in 97. Yeah. Um, but yeah, everyone's everybody has extracurricular activities in this band, and we're all very supportive of each other. That's I mean, awesome. Rob's playing in another group called The Skull, who we're on tour with right now. Right. Justin puts on a festival, an annual festival called The Ceremony of Sludge, and I think we're probably going to be playing that in a couple of months. And he's actually the first person in the band to actually read Star Creek on the road while we're, while we're out. Yeah. Kayla's constantly doing like West Side Story or something like that. And my girlfriend and I'll go, go see her perform. And so we all have other lives. This, this band, I mean, we certainly didn't start a doom metal band in Portland in 97 with the idea that it would be a full-time job or a, or a lifelong career. I mean, I'm really proud that it's still going and that it's constantly growing, but you know that can't really be a full-time day job unless something really drastic changes right so that being the case it's something that we pour a lot of energy into part of the year and we all have other things that we that we do and, and we support each other because everyone in the band's really positive and and 
uh, motivated. Have they all read Star Creek at this point? No, only Justin. So only far. Justin. So and Rob has has said that he wants to, and I think Kayla's waiting for the version on tape. Yeah, the audiobook version. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Star Creek. Now that comes out next month. Um, as of recording this, uh, this will air Thursday. We're recording it Wednesday. What's today? Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. As of this morning, I could not find it yet for pre-order on Amazon. Cameron wants it to be pre-ordered. I think maybe about a month from the release date, something right. like that. So, so it should be very soon. Very probably soon. next week. And Dave, remind me next week. We'll remind the listening audience that it's up for pre-order. That would be wonderful. But yes, yeah, Star Creek. For the listeners out there, it's S T A R R. Creek. Um, you've got early advance copies on sale at the merch table at Witch Mountain Shows. Yep. What's uh, What's been the response to those so far? Oh, it's so cool. I mean, there are, there are two kinds of people that have been buying it. One are the people that knew about it and anticipated it. I mean, we've even had people come that weren't coming to the show that just wanted to try to get a copy of the book, yeah. which I was very flattered by. Fuck yeah, they um, bought a ticket. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then there are people who walk by the merch table and just kind of it, it catches their, their gaze, they scratch their head, and they say, what are these books? And I made a point to not just put Star Creek out, even though that's mainly what I'm pushing right, right. now. But I, you know, I've got Cthulhu Photogen, Swords vs. Cthulhu, Eternal Frankenstein uh, copies there, and I think I'm picking up Madness of Dr. Caligari uh, anthologies when I get to the Twin Cities. Right. So just having that display of like multiple books kind of makes people say, well, what's going on That's here? That's smart. That's and, smart. Uh, and so then I kind of give them my spiel. I have them read the back of the book that talks about what they might find inside. Uh, maybe I drop a Stranger Things reference on them. Yeah. And, uh, and I let them know that these are there's only 100 copies. These are hand numbered. This is the first edition. And the tour edition has the tour dates printed in the back as oh, well. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. I didn't get it, Cameron. You didn't send me a tour edition. You got the you got the negative world zero yeah. zero one zero edition. So. Okay, so mine's even rarer. Yes, exactly. thank you, Cameron. And it has even more typos. I take back everything. <laughs> <laughs> does yours have page numbers though? My first published book did not have page numbers. Yours yeah, does. It does. So I remember that I would did a World Horror two thousand one in Seattle, and my first published book came out that week and uh, the publisher shipped them to Jeff Cooper who was living in Seattle at the time and uh, I call him from the road and I said did my book arrive yet and he says your book arrived I think he put the page numbers in another box <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about yeah, yeah, no page numbers in the damn book you didn't want to just hand number them no <laughs> <laughs> alright so Star Creek it's set in 1986 rural Oregon it features heavy metal teens Christian biker gangs and hopped up kids on ATVs all colliding when strange occurrences unveil an alien world inhabiting the Oregon woods. Now, you said earlier that Phantasm was an influence. You just mentioned Stranger Things. Um, you know, I, I think comparisons to Stranger Things are going to be unavoidable. Yeah. Um, but I also think that's kind of unfair. Because I think, this is my suspicion, uh -huh. Twin Peaks and a cartoon called Gravity Falls. Are you familiar with either of those? I've definitely watched Twin Peaks, and I, in fact, uh, represented Julie Cruz for a while as an agent. Okay. Um, so I've had some involvement with them. I have not seen Gravity Falls. And Stranger Things, of course, didn't come out until well after this book yeah, exactly, was Exactly, exactly. All right. Um, I, I think for, for fans of Gravity Falls out there, and I know there are a lot of you, especially our under-30 listeners, you need to buy this fucking book. Um, and you need to go watch Gravity yeah, Falls. Yeah, sounds like it. I the will. Dungeon Master turned me on to it. It's a bunch of kids in the woods in Oregon. They're living with their uncle for the summer. Oh, wow. It's in Oregon? Yeah, it's in Oregon. Oh, cool. And there's all these strange things that happen out in the woods. It, it turns out it's this, this demon named Bill Cipher who looks like the Illuminati symbol. Cool. I mean, it, it's a kid's cartoon, but yeah, it... it it's it shares a kinship with Star Star Creek and Phantasm and Twin Peaks of course and Stranger Things, so yeah I just I wondered about that. Um, I suspect there were some autobiographical elements. For sure. For yeah. Sure. You, any you want to touch on or nothing you want to put out there on the air? <laughs> uh, I mean certainly, you know there were there were some profound psychedelic experiences that I had on Star Creek Road in reality. Yeah. And. Um, and there were real 
inbred families living out there with no lights and running water. Really? I mean, this is a haunted road near where I grew up on a goat farm in rural Oregon. And so when it came time to write this book, I wanted to leverage off just the vibe of that place and some of the memories that I had, but I just wanted to make it way more fucked up. Yeah. There were there were two scenes that, that really impact me. One in a, a sort of sweet, nostalgic way. Mm-hmm. And and one in a holy shit that creeped me the fuck out way. Um, when when the boys find and again listeners no spoilers here okay but the the boys find the thing out in the woods they accidentally hit it with their bike yeah and then they give it oxy yeah that reminded me when we were kids we we found a stray cat out in the woods uh, and none of us none of our parents would let us bring the cat home so we built him a little cat house in the woods and we would bring him table scraps every night mm-hmm. we'd all sneak out and this cat. Stayed in the woods for like five years until we all graduated and moved away. Wow. Uh, it just, it made me, I hadn't thought of that cat in years and it made me think of that. And we could never agree on a name for the cat because there was like five of us that had found it. I know when my mom was a little girl, she found a frog that had been hit by a car and uh, she played doctor with it in the basement and was sewing its legs back on with a needle <laughs> and thread and her dad got threw it in the garbage, I think. Oh, man. <laughs> The, the part that really fucked me up, um, you get the character of Alan. Yeah. Now, Alan's a 16-year-old virgin. Um, again, no spoilers, but his encounter with Kitty and the black goat. It, that's a hard scene to write or read. That was my question. Uh, I mean, that scene just drips with menace. It is uncomfortable to read. It's probably... I'd have to go all the way back to J.F. Gonzalez's Survivor and the baby. I don't know that I've read a scene that's made me that uncomfortable since. Well, that's uh, high praise this. coming from you, so yeah. thank you very much. But you yeah, know, I mean, I, I went thinking about it, and I, and I was concerned. For a while, I was concerned about readers, and then I decided I don't care. Well, and the thing <laughs> is, the, the way you write it, it's not exploitative at all. Nope. I mean, it's, it's, it's played straight. Um, well, it's, likewise it's with Kira, Kira and Rex, too. Yeah. I mean, I, I know Cameron told me he's he's like I was really worried about that scene but then the way it resolved he was he was really happy with yeah. it so how difficult were those scenes to write I mean did you have to stop yourself and you know did was there lots of revision involved in those two particular scenes or not that I particularly recall I mean I think they came out that I mean I pretty much knew what I wanted to do yeah so I wrote it and then I went back and looked at it and just tried to you know sculpt it a bit but okay. but for the most part Really, most of my editing and revision in this was just to do with language. Okay. All right. Um, talk about language. What surprised me most is your writing style. Um, you know, now, as I said earlier, I see a progression from your short fiction to this. Um, you know, for listeners out there, this is weird fiction meets bizarro. Uh, it, it's Laird Barron meets Garrett Cook, or maybe, you know, Laird Barron meets Cameron Pierce. I don't know. Um, you know, while most weird fiction prose is very heavily detailed, um, your style is very stripped down for this. It's it's almost more Jack Ketchum than it is H.P. Lovecraft. Um, you know, it's an action-packed narrative. It's very driven. And you just pow on the plot twist. Like, every chapter, there's a new plot twist. Um, but despite that stripped-down nature, it's still very heavy on atmosphere and detail. It's not really a question, but it's an observation I had. And since I'm one of the the first people to read this Mm -hmm. book, and and since you're one of the writers that I've been watching, I just want to let you know that. Good job. Thank you very Um, much. It's, it's, you know, for people out there that aren't writers, that's an incredibly hard trick to pull off. And the fact that you did this with your debut novella, that, that says there are very good things to come. So... He's blushing now. <laughs> um, so, you've done nonfiction, you've done short fiction, your first novella's out. Is a novel next? That's the plan, yes. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Are you working on it or just brainstorming it? I've been working on it for 13 years. Ooh. <laughs> but I don't want to, I mean... Outli- it's not your out- trunk novel. Outlining, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's there are no chapters yet. Okay. But, um, and in theory, it takes place in the same world as this, but in the future. Okay. So sort of an interconnected mythos there? Yes. All right. Um, all right. Well, I know you got to get back on the road to Philly. Um, we already talked about where Witch Mountain is playing, um, but where can folks find out more about Star Creek? 
Well, I have a Goodreads page. Lazy Fascist Press is the publisher. Obviously, it's going to be on Amazon. Uh, I believe that will be where the pre-order is. Okay. And yeah, we'll uh, we'll definitely let listeners know when that's up for pre-order. Cameron, it would help if you would text me and remind me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I like picking on Cameron. I'm looking forward to seeing him next month, too. Are you going to be at Bizarro Con? I will, I will be at Bizarro right, Con. Excellent. I'm very happy about that because initially we were scheduled to be in Europe at that time and I was going to miss it and it was kind of crushing. Right. And then that tour got postponed and all of a sudden many things became possible. So, I'm super excited. Bizarro Con is my favorite it's, convention it's of the year. It's quickly becoming... I mean, you know, obviously scares that care. I'm involved with the charity. Yeah. I'm involved with the convention. But, yeah, for me to go and relax, Bizarro Con has become my favorite. Yeah. You know, especially now that apparently there's not going to be world horror for a few years, mm-hmm. you know. So, um, yeah, it's it's a good time. And, you know, uh, it's open to everybody. You know, if, uh, I, I mean, they, they limit the amount of, tickets they sell, but I think there's still tickets available for Bizarro Con this year if anybody wants to go. Yeah, I mean, it's it's growing, but at a very manageable pace, exactly. it seems. Like, And, uh, of course, like anything else, you know, ten years from now, we're going to look back on these times and say, oh, we, it was really nice when it was just a hundred people oh, that's there. Coming. That's coming. Yeah. You know, that's coming very quick. Alright, so we're about halfway done the show. Before we get to our next musical performance, I want to remind folks, this week's episode is brought to you by Pulp Fest 2018. That takes place July 26th through 29th at the Doubletree by Hilton in Cranberry Township, Pennsylvania. That's out near Pittsburgh. Uh, Bring your money, okay? Because there's going to be thousands of pulp magazines, vintage horror, fantasy, and science fiction paperbacks, original artwork, and other collectibles. Also, this year's guest of honor is our dear friend Joe R. Lansdale. You can learn more about it at pulpfest. Dot com. That's pulpfest.com. All right. Another musical performance. In case you missed it uh, during this year's telethon, here is uh, industrial metal band Discipline Theory being joined on vocals by our very own Mary San Giovanni. Let's give that a listen. Come back. Okay. She's going to sing. All right. I'm hoping she knows this song. I hope this is a song. It's a pretty big song. Lots of people know it's not ours. We, start, we borrowed it. Without asking. <laughs> so did I. Hello? Make sure she has a little more volume on her vocals. I want to make sure everyone hears her. Hello. Just about everyone knows this song. Okay, good. But, you know, we do it a little bit. Okay. Just like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's, uh, yeah, so just over here. Whichever part you know. Okay. So, I mean, as cheesy it sounds, when people say, if you know it, feel free to come up and sing along. If you know the dance moves, well, we heard you sing earlier. feel free to come up and do <laughs> the moves. See if you recognize it.
Okay, and then finally, our final segment of this show from episode 111. Uh, here is Mary and I sitting down with Grammy Award winning uh, vocalist for Queensryche, uh, as well as his solo career and other bands. I am, of course, talking about the legendary Jeff Tate. All right, Mary, we are here at the Telus 360 in Lancaster with uh, none other than multi-platinum selling, Grammy-nominated singer, musician, and actor, Jeff Tate, who, of course, rose to prominence as the former lead singer of Queens, right? One of the biggest progressive metal bands of all time, and also, as regular listeners know, my favorite fucking band of all time. This is um, true. Jeff has also had a notable solo career with releases such as Kings and Thieves and the eponymous Jeff Tate. For decades, he's been consistently ranked and honored as one of the best metal vocalists of all time by Hit Parader, That Metal Show, Rolling Stone, Vegas Rocks, OC Weekly, many more. Um, he recently put his skills as a legendary frontman to work in front of the camera, playing a sadistic killer in the found footage slasher film The Burning More Deaths, which is available right now on DVD and Amazon Prime. He's currently crossing the country for the Whole Story Acoustic Tour. Jeff, welcome to the show. It's an honor. Thank you. Um, I, I got to tell you, now, I've sat in a green room and talked comic books with Alice Cooper. I've given Bruce Campbell advice on planning a book signing tour. Stephen King gave me a, a wonderful, unexpected blurb. But I think this might be the first time I'm restraining myself from going full fanboy with somebody. <laughs> so if I leap across and hug you, I apologize. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm used to that. Perfect. I'm used to that. <laughs> You're used to that? It's okay. Mary, you can fill in. You can jump across and hug him and be a little better. All right. All right. Um, so this tour is sort of the story of your life. It's, it's songs you wrote throughout different stages of your life. How long did it take you to select the, the, the set list? I mean, were there songs that you're like, oh, yeah, I don't want to revisit that? Or um, it, it, uh, it actually came together very quickly. Uh, I, I kind of knew instinctively what I wanted to play and then it was down to getting the band to play it and seeing how they how they did with right. it you know there was a few songs that I wanted to do that we we ended up not being able to do because it just didn't work <clears throat> and you never really know um, how a song is going to work until you start playing it you know right and you might be able to put it together with a really nice uh, you know, uh, arrangement in the rehearsal studio, but then when you pull it out live and play it, it just doesn't seem to, you know, connect right. with people, uh, which is somewhat of a disappointment. But uh, you learn to deal with it and swallow your pride and move on. You know? <laughs> and luckily, I can pick another song. <laughs> I got a lot of them. <laughs> now, now we were we were talking in the bar earlier. Uh, we found out we have the same work ethic. I write every day. You write every day. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you're writing while on tour, though. I mean, how do you, do you feel like you're getting a lot accomplished writing on a tour bus? I mean, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, I write on headphones. Yeah, you know, so so you just drown out the rest of the yeah. rest of the crew, all the drama. You you're unaware. You're just sitting there writing every day. Well, I'm kind of aware, but uh, I, I kind of really get into what I do a right. lot. Um, I'm kind of a, like a junkie in that respect. You know, I'm really addictive to. The, the, the creative um, atmosphere. I like to be in a creative atmosphere at, at all times if I can help it. I hear you. I'm Absolutely. Somewhat, I'm somewhat dismayed and disappointed if I'm not right. <laughs> in a creative environment, you know? Yeah. So, um, but I find headphones really help uh, kind of cut you off from what's going on on the outside so right. that way you can kind of focus what's going on on the inside. So what, what you're... I think uh, from here in Lancaster, I think you guys travel to Canada next. So mm -hmm. will you just be doing rough ideas, or are you doing, like, keyboard work? Yeah, I do both. Yeah, both yeah. while you're yeah. traveling. Yeah. Wow. I do editing. I do uh, um, composition, um, lyric writing, just everything. Yeah. You know? How much has that changed since, I guess, I'm a longtime Queensryche fan. I mean, the legend is 1981. You guys are putting together a demo tape, and they have one song without lyrics. The lady wore black, mm -hmm. and they ask you to write the lyrics. Has your process changed from then to now? I mean, mm. or is it still at its core? The well, I, I actually learned. Um, we talked about writing every day. I, I didn't used to write every day. Um, I started that um, probably around the time of uh, maybe uh, Empire. Yeah, I think. And uh, that's where I really got into the, the discipline of it, you know. Before that, I was just kind of writing when the mood, you know, took me, right. you know, or if I had to get something done. 
but uh, around then is when I really got into the discipline of it and uh, working a full day you know, at it and then putting it away for the night and coming back the next day and having a jumping off point. Right. You know, I think uh, Julie Cameron was her name. She wrote this uh, book called The Artist's Way, which I found to be uh, really inspirational, where she said it really helps to leave something undone each day. That yes. way you have some place to start that, yes. on the next day, you know. And so I've kind of taken that... Uh, that concept. The same method I use. I, I, I end literally in the middle of a sentence yeah. every day yeah. and then pick it up. You know. It's a great jump, jumping off point, a great process you know, to uh, start from. A song like uh, Take a Bullet off Kings and Thieves or Jet City Woman, I mean, as a, as a fan, I'm assuming these are deeply personal songs for you, just based on the lyrics. Uh, it feels to me like you, you bled a bit of yourself into those lyrics. Um, is the process for writing something like that harder than it is for something lighter like, I don't know, like Last Time in Paris, something like that? Um, I mean, does it take you longer when, it, when it's really personal like that? Uh, gosh. I, I, I don't think so. No? No. It, it, I'm trying to think of the, the, those instances that you cited there. Uh, Last Time in Paris was a situational... Um, uh, event you yeah. know, that just happened, and so I just <laughs> wrote it. <laughs> I wrote it down, and I didn't actually put that uh, lyric to music f- for like a year later. Yeah. You know, but like last time in Paris, it's it's lighthearted, it's fun. Mm-hmm. Take a bullet. I mean, you know, as somebody who would do anything for his friends, and and has had those friends turn on him once in a while. I mean, that that song strikes a chord with me as, as something mm. much more personal. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I suppose it is, but getting in touch with how you feel about things is part of the exercise of writing, I think, as, as you know. Oh, yeah. um, you know, you, it's hard, I think, and, and difficult uh, sometimes to access that part of yourself and then let that out, you know. But once you're in there and, you, and you're, you're, you've, you've cut yourself open, you know, you might as well bleed on the page. Right, exactly. <laughs> Since you got to bleed anyway, right? <laughs> Some of the, the tougher things for me to write have been, uh, say, um, Sweet Sister Mary from op- the first Operation Mindcrime was a real tough one to write. Really? Yeah. Because I, I, I wanted to write from Mary's perspective and uh, try to capture a, um, a, 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 the, the female point of view. Right. Which is, I find, very difficult to do. Um, now, I find that interesting because you, you, you are a father of four daughters. Five. Five daughters. Yeah. And, and, and at what? least one grand, granddaughter. Right? I have five grandkids. Wow. Yeah. And, and yet you struggle with finding the, the female voice. I do. Voice. Yeah. I'm yeah. pretty uh, masculine. <laughs> I, just, I started to say that and I thought, should I say that? <laughs> That's what we were talking about, that song. And that the whole album on the way down. And can I tell them the story? Yeah, go ahead. Tell the school, story. Cause, you know, because my name is Mary. So when I was in high school, friends would pull up to me in the parking lot, and I hear the power window go down, and they'd go, "Kill her. That's all you have to do. Kill Mary. She's a risk, and get the priest as well." And I thought, how awesome! <laughs> I'm glad you'd look at it that way rather than uh, oh, it's the opposite. It's yeah. it's Speaking of mind crime, I, it's hard for me to believe. I guess it is for you. That album turns 30 years old next yeah, year. I know. Um, every time I listen to it, and that is often Mary. Mary can oh, contest. Yeah. It's it's one of my go-to. This is what I'm listening to today. Alphas. You know, it, it takes me back to that time in history. Crooked politicians, totalitarian organized religions, America bombing a country in the Middle East. And yet, the story, those lyrics, they could easily reflect the world of 2017. Um, you know, it's such a seminal, genre-changing work. But is it frustrating to you, as the artist, that many of the things you spoke out about in that album were, are things we're still dealing with 30 years later? Um, it, yeah, it's kind of surprising. Yeah? Yeah, I, I would have thought in my younger days that we would have uh, moved a little quicker as a world society, right. you know, at recognizing certain things and, and go about changing those things. Um, but as an older man now, I see that that's kind of the way civilization is. You know, we, we move pretty slow. 
and changing our ideas, and it, it's sort of a generational thing. I've been coming you know, to the same. As one yeah. generation ends and, and leaves, uh, you know, the next generation takes over, and, and some of those ideas that the last generation left cling to us, you know, kind of mm-hmm. like uh, dog hair, you know, <laughs> and uh, we have to wipe that clean, you know. Yeah. And um, like, for instance, the, the, the word socialism, for example. Like, uh, my generation is probably a lot um, more comfortable with the term socialism than my parents are. Agreed. And, right. and right. their parents are absolutely not comfortable with that word, mm-hmm. you know. So, you know, when my parents are gone uh, and, and I'm in that position now, my kids think Bernie Sanders is, is great. They love his ideas. They can't understand why we haven't done that already, you know. But, you know, the, first, you know, the previous generations are going, Socialist! Oh, well, it's, mad! Yeah. Equals communism! Yeah, <laughs> you know? it, it's, it's true. Because that's my, what they were sold. Yeah, my, my oldest, is uh, he, he's 26 years old and uh, conceived after the Building Empires show in Hershey back in the day, by the way. <laughs> really? But, uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, he, <laughs> he, was, he was a Bernie Sanders guy. And, uh, you know, my father, Vietnam era veteran, was not a Bernie Sanders guy. He was a Hillary guy. And, and listening to the yeah. two of them debate it, it, it's very much a generational thing. Um, yeah, but those those concepts and um, situations that were happening within the mind crime story are, are just as prevalent today, like yeah. you said. Oh, I agree. Nothing's changed. I agree. And that's only been 30 years, you know. American Soldier, that that's one of my personal favorites. That, that was an album of songs, you know, they were all war stories from the perspective of those serving in the military. Now, you spent several years interviewing veterans from World War II to Iraq, um, including your own father. Mm-hmm. And you collected their stories. Um, this is just a personal question for me. Have you ever considered turning those stories into a book? Like, a, 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 you know, all those interviews. I never thought about that. No. You should. <laughs> I, would, I would read the hell out of that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. It um, would be interesting. It would be inter- that was a fascinating project to be part of. I'm so I feel very fortunate to have had that experience and um, and and shared in those um, stories. I, I got to tell you, I think uh, post Empire, I, I think that's probably my favorite Queens right album, hmm. American Soldier. Interesting. Um, I, I, that struck a chord with me. All right. Yeah, uh, you never know. You know, you never know as an artist how your work is going to affect somebody. Yeah, I mean, it's true. It, you, you just put it out there, and things, uh, things have a life of their own, you know, for various reasons. Yeah. You know, uh, for example, like the Empire album, uh, that affected a lot of people because a lot of people heard it. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. there was a was was six, six million dollar um, promotional budget for that album. Jesus. You know, the last record I did had a promotional budget of... Three hundred dollars. <laughs> so you know, you see the difference. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> can I ask a Can I ask a question? Well, yeah, you're a co-host on the show. Okay. You're allowed. I'm re- I've been recently promoted to co-host, so oh. I still congratulations. Feel Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite album of all the ones you've ever done? Um, because you said you know, like you said that artists are never sure. Because we run into the same thing with books, like. The books oh, yeah. that we write, our favorite ones are never the ones that fans like the best. So, which one? Which one is your personal favorite? Well, I have. Um, I, I set certain artistic goals for myself over time, uh, and probably the first real artistic goal that I achieved that I felt strongly and good about was uh, the Promised Land album. I wanted right. to write a record that had a certain. Um, feeling throughout the entire record Mm -hmm. and I'd never done that before every record had always had multiple sort of uh, kinds of songs on it Uh, it was kind of like I don't know how to explain it but different moods right Right. and I wanted I wanted to create a record that where you just hung in this certain feeling throughout the record and and the trick was to uh, you know create create different colors within that mood but still retain that mood and I right. thought the closest that I got to that sort of uh, criteria was uh, Promised Land. I would agree especially and it all seems to culminate in that final title track hmm. you know yeah I, I think if that's what you set out to achieve then yeah, yeah. as a fan I, I think you did well. Good. Um, all right. 
but yeah, I know what you mean. It's like uh, you never know how your material is going to affect people, and, and people take it so differently. They do. You know, like um, I, like I, if you read my lyrics and you read interviews I've done, when people ask me about certain situations, I don't think it's very difficult to identify that I'm pretty liberal minded. Right. right. You know, right. I've been traveling in 65 countries I've seen a lot of things and met a lot of people and I've been in a lot of situations I'm pretty open minded to the world right Right. but I have fans that are opposite of that I mean incredibly opposite than that you know and I don't get that I don't understand why that is other than perhaps I can't read (laughs) (laughs) that could be it or they just they hear what they want to hear I, I think there's there's an element of it. To, I you know my my novels have been praised by the you know the extreme left, the alt right, and everybody in between. And and I, you know I'm not above keeping my mouth shut and, my, and buy a book. Sure. But, you sure. Know, but I am also not shy about expressing my my own politics. You know I'm I'm a, I'm a pretty left leaning guy, and uh, I think if they if they go beyond the books, they find that out pretty quick. But all right, so Mary, you said we're just about out of time here. Well, we got to let Jeff go on. Minutes. It depends. On All right, I'm cool. I'm cool. cool. I'd rather do this. Right. And... Um, we have to squeeze in loyal listener Paul Ligurski. He, he <laughs> demanded that that we ask this. Um, now this is his question, not mine. He says, "What was the inspiration to the greatest song ever, Roads to Madness, and was it Jeff who came up with the phrase Grand Transition in the song?" Yeah. 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 Okay. I did. Um, the story I always give about that song, because I get asked this a lot yeah. about that particular song, is that uh, it was uh, early on in um, Queensryche's career, and um, I was feeling quite a lot of pressure to write. Um, we had just gotten signed, and, right. that, and, and with that action, I felt very responsible now uh, to be um, productive. And uh, I think a, a bit of that, the pressure of being in that situation really affected me because I, I uh, started having trouble sleeping. And I'd never, ever had a problem sleeping in my whole life and still don't to this day. But at the beginning, after we got signed, I couldn't sleep. I was a nervous wreck. And uh, I went for, like, weeks without getting a proper amount of sleep. Right. I'd, I'd sleep maybe 30 minutes, an hour one day, two hours the next day, you know, things like that. So I was really sleep deprived and uh, wrote that song uh, under massive amounts of sleep deprivation. (laughs) So there you go. There you go, Paul. All right, let's... uh, There's bits of delirium in the lyrics (laughs) on that song. (laughs) All right. all about delirium. Since we are the horror show, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the Burning More Deaths. Now, Mary and I just watched it, what, last weekend? It was... Yeah, yeah something like so. that. Weekend, yeah. Um, yeah, we both agreed it was fucking creepy to see you as a psychotic killer. It was. And, you, mean, were, and you were good. And I mean that in a good way. I don't mean that like, yeah, you make a well, really I mean, killer. We, but... we know you from, you know, we <laughs> we were the couple in the fifth row at every show. And, right, you know, right. we know you from watching the, the videos over the years and, and the interviews. But, I mean, your character was just so goddamn gleeful while he's killing these people yes. in horrible ways. How did you get into his head? I tell you, that was one of the toughest situations I've ever been in. Really? really? Yeah, really? I, wasn't, I wasn't really prepared for what happened. Just being on the, <laughs> the set was miserable? The set was miserable. It was, it was uh, this uh, old military base out in Queens right. on, the, okay. on the water. Right. And it was winter, and it was freezing cold and snowing and raining and miserable. And uh, It was filmed inside these different barracks. Mm-hmm. And uh, there were holes in the in the ceiling and the roofs, and it was leaking inside. There was mildew everywhere, oh, and God. people had vandalized these buildings and mm-hmm. done all kinds of who knows what. And it had really bad energy, right? right. And uh, but that really helped sort of get into the headspace, you know. Yeah. And uh, I just uh, 
dressed up in the costume and didn't take a, a shower or a bath. I slept in those clothes, covered in artificial blood, oh, sticky syrup, sticky and shit. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just, you know, I, I, I lived a lot of the time on the floor. Yeah. You know, the wood floors of the building, and um, there was just caked dirt under my fingernails the whole time. So and, you know, really were I was, I was method acting the whole time right now. <laughs> and I, I, had a, I had a bit of a decompression to come out of that after the shooting, and, um, and then I got all upset about I didn't want my kids to see this right. you know because it's pretty violent <laughs> and seeing your dad as this violent right yeah and seeing this your dad as this violent character I thought, thought right. I could have real that impact on my on my kids you know and um, so I I uh Never let them watch it. Yeah, I I still haven't seen the movie. Yeah, really? yeah. I don't know what's in it or how it turned out or. Oh, you know what? Apparently, I wrote some music for it. You yeah, you, you scored did. the film. I yes. I don't have a recollection of the music on it. In fact, they asked me the other day. They sent me the um, the paperwork. So funny. After after I found out the movie was coming out, I contacted everybody and said, "Hey, is the movie coming out?" And they said, "Yeah." And I go, "Well, should we?" figure out what's going on with, the, with everything like that and they said oh yeah well you signed a bunch of stuff and well we'll send you what we have and they sent me all these copies of contracts that I signed but when it says you know music it says to be determined oh, really? <laughs> so, well, the, the credits say that you wrote the music yeah they, oh. they've got you there. Yeah. and the keyboard score was great you had yeah. a, a real John Carpenter vibe it's, to it oh. you know but, yeah. I have to actually get a copy and listen to it and figure out what I did I, I hope you get some royalties <laughs> for this <laughs> Dude, I mean, it, was, it was fascinating though because I Twitter we're movie you know we watch horror movies all the time mm-hmm. and most of the time when I get to pick something if it's not straight up monsters then it's it's killers. Oh, yeah. I have this like fascination with forensic stuff. I said we have to watch this He's, because it's basically John List and the Amityville guy, the, mm-hmm. the DeFeo, right? Yeah. Bonnie DeFeo. Yeah. If you kind of put them in a blender. Yeah, yeah. I'd say that was Only the inspiration cooler. for the movie. Yeah. <laughs> but it's Jeff Tate. But it's Jeff Tate. You so know. It's cooler. Well, when it was when it was conceived and when it was shot it was quite a while ago, and since then a lot of films have come out that that uh, it is sort of like now. Right. You right. know, so I think if it would have come out when it was right. first made, it would have made a little bit different impact. You know, I think. Right. All right, so last question, and then we'll let you uh, go chill before the concert. Um, Resurrection came out last September. Mm-hmm. You know, you're currently, as I said, on the, the whole story acoustic tour. Um, you're a grandfather now, as we discussed earlier. I am. Now, you know, last year, I went on tour, what, baby, March? Yeah, I think it was March. And I started. came home in December, and I've got a nine-year-old at home, and, and this was the first time I've done an extensive tour like that with somebody at home. It was tough for me. Do you, you know, as as you becoming a granddad, do you still find you love it out here on the road, or are you anxious to get home? I'm pretty anxious to get home right yeah. now. Yeah, I've been out since uh, November. Yeah. So was that November, December, that's January, February, March, April? Five months. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. yeah, five months. Yeah, that's. I'm at the end of my rope right now. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. a long time to tour. I, I told it you, is. too. It's, you know, it's hard to be gone from your own bed and your own stuff you know, for that long. Well, the funny thing is, while I've been on the road, my wife, who was a real estate agent, mm-hmm. sold our house. Yeah. Oh, my. And <laughs> she bought another house oh, and okay. moved all of our stuff into the new house and is having the new house remodeled. And I haven't seen it yet. You haven't seen the house? <laughs> Just in photos, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to go home and uh, unpack all my stuff that's not unpacked yet. And find everything. And it's a new adventure. Where's the new bathroom? Adventure. Yeah, and where's the bathroom? <laughs> right. My first That'll question will be. Yes, the first thing. Where's the bathroom? <laughs> Well, Jeff, that's a long time. Man, thank you so much. This oh, yeah. has been an honor to have you. Yeah, well, thank you. I, we're doing good. We had Stephen King last week Great. gave us a contribution. Jeff Tate this week. Next week, I think it's just Dave and I yammering to each other. So <laughs> I, I don't know how we'll top this. Yeah, what do you talk about when you don't have guests? <laughs> <laughs> the internet never fails us. Oh, yeah, the oh, internet always sure. comes so, up with something fun. Yeah, there's always something I'm to talk sure about. I'm sure Trump will do something stupid. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jeff, oh, I'm sure. <laughs> thank you so much. And, and, and uh, our Canadian listeners, if you're catching this Thursday night, um, I believe uh, Toronto 
and the day after this show airs in our, Ottawa. And Ottawa, Ontario. or no? Ottawa? Ottawa and Quebec City. Yeah, Ottawa, Quebec City. Ottawa. The day after this show airs, and then Quebec City. So, mm-hmm. please go check them out. Uh, just based on the sound check alone, you are in for a treat. Yes, it's it's really hypnotizing, and I don't say that about many things. It really is. It is. Mary thought it was cute during sound check. They did Eyes of a Stranger, just a, a, a fraction of Eyes of a Stranger, and I had goosebumps, had goosebumps. going up and down my arm. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know, it's just, I have to say, uh, of all the tours I've done. This one has been so special to me because uh, of a number of things. One, I've worked with two completely different bands on this tour, right. Right. Uh, which is phenomenal. The chance to be able to work with these these young players who are very enthusiastic and very good players that right. had that. Um, and I feel very fortunate and blessed to have had that association with them. Uh, secondly, this is the first tour I've done since probably the Mind Crime tour, first tour. Uh, that I've done on uh, monitors without using in-ear monitors. No kidding. Yeah, so I, I'm 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 aware of what's going on in the room. Right. You know, not locked in right. my own little world, right. and I I can hear people talking, and carrying on conversations, and it's affected how I do the show. I've yeah. turned it into kind of an improv thing where there's there's times where I interrupt their conversation. I go, so what's going on? <laughs> what, what are we I'm talking sorry. about here? Am I bothering you? Because I I want to um, yeah, and it, it's so fun to do things like that because it's a uh, it, it takes kind of the showbiz element of a show out of it right, and all of a sudden right. brings it into reality. Right. It's more you know? intimate, I think. It's right? very intimate. Oh, yeah. And there's a lot of storytelling. I talk about a lot of the, the songs and where my head was at during the song or what was happening with the band or I me. Won't, I won't song. lie. That's what I'm looking forward to tonight. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So. yeah. Some of it's uh, pretty interesting. Others of it's total drivel, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you decide which is wet. <laughs> All right. Well, Jeff, thank you so much, man. We appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. So we hope you enjoyed uh, this week's mixture of old and new. Dave, did you enjoy it? Absolutely. Okay, good. You know what I enjoy, Dave? Hulkfest? Morphine. Oh, well. (laughs) The one time you follow my lead, I step on it myself. (laughs) I know. That was perfect. I enjoy morphine and I enjoy Oxycontin. You know what else I enjoyed? The sponge baths Mary's been giving me. <laughs> they're they're not sexual at all. I, uh, you know, most men have that, that sponge bath fantasy, yeah. but I, I got to tell you, when you get it in real life, it ain't like that. But we will talk about that next week, as well as uh, Weird, Weird Webzine's uh, editor and his comments and my accident, and I'll describe what it actually feels like to be on fire and to, to see the skin fall off your arm and... All kinds of other fun things. But before I do that, you're right, Dave. We should talk about Pulp Fest, which takes place July 26th through 29th at Doubletree by Hilton in Cranberry Township, Pennsylvania. Uh, A dealer's room packed with pulp magazines, paperbacks, original art, comic books, other collectibles. You know what else is packed in that dealer's room? Uh, Joe Lansdale. Joe Lansdale, the guest of honor. You can learn more at pulpfest.com. Uh, again, I want to thank everybody for their support. I promise you we'll give you a full show next week if I'm feeling up to it. Um, in the meantime, uh, go to the horror show with BrianKeen.com and click show archives and you can listen to four years worth of programming all for free, all for free. Um, and if that's not enough for you, wherever you're listening to this show, which is, again, made available via the Project Entertainment Network. You can listen to uh, my spinoff podcast, Defender's Dialogue, which I do with Christopher Golden, or you can listen to Mary's spinoff podcast, podcast Cosmic Shenanigans. Uh, are you going to talk about Nate Carson's book? You really should. It's on my list. Is it, yeah, it's, it's on your on list. list. What, yeah. uh, there's, I've seen that list. That list is longer than the, the skin that was falling off my arm. <laughs> well, there's a lot of great stuff to cover. Yeah. Uh, it's a black list. The, the list is blacker than my wrist. Poor, <laughs> poor Mary. She when she got there, they already had me in the ambulance, and, and she said my wrist looked like a, a chicken bone that had been left on the grill overnight. It was so black. It did. You smelled like burning. I smelled like burning. You smelled Dave. like burning. <laughs> I want to do an Old Spice commercial parody, but it's it's burning. It's burning. It's burning. Look at your man. Now look at my arm. Look at your man. Look at my arm. Look at your man. My arm. We may have to work on that. (laughs) 
All right. Uh, and you know, if you're just tired of listening to podcasts and you want a little visual entertainment, go to Twitch. <laughs> dot tv where is this going <laughs> slash meteor notes twitch dot tv slash meteor notes and you can watch dave dave will you set yourself on fire for your viewers no i will not no. because a it sounds awful and b i'm pretty sure i get kicked off the air dungeon <laughs> dungeon master yeah aside from calling me nick valentine all week uh now for those who don't play the fallout video game for <laughs> nick valentine is a synth that means he's a synthetic yeah. human he's a he's a robot and much of my left arm is now synthetic. It has synthetic synthetic stuff on it. And uh, so Dungeon Master's been calling me Nick Valentine all week. <laughs> he keep waiting for me to get superpowers. But but the other thing he said, and I thought, oh, this is my son. He said, if only you had been recording it, Dad, you could have put it on the podcast. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, I'm pretty sure that's not a good idea. No, he's... <laughs> he usually has ingenious ideas. Not what I'm going to say. He's you know, been very, very brave. I can only... Imagine. He's been a big helper. Yeah. He's, um, been a big helper. he's he's he's, awesome. he's helped Mary and his mother take care of me. Uh, he was very brave when the paramedics showed up and worked on Daddy, and he had many questions for the police officer who calmed him and soothed him. And uh, and, I, and I will I will thank all those folks next week as well. Uh, we it's going to be a four hour show next week. We're going to talk about all about the fire. So we will see you then, folks. All right, bye. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, Project Entertainment Network presents The Mondo Method. An old man with a goatee teaches a younger guy with a beard how to write. Introducing first, he's the mentor and the greatest manager of all time, Mondo Guerrero. And from parts unknown, up and coming superstar, The Great Buddha. Okay, so maybe their names are really just Armand Rosamilia and Chuck Buddha, and maybe you'll learn something while they're at it. Wednesdays exclusively on Project Entertainment Network.